Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Yvonne and I wish you a very warm welcome to Singapore Perspectives 2018, the annual flagship conference of the Institute of Policy Studies. We are very pleased to have you here with us today and we'd like to thank our donors whose names are listed here for their generous support. The theme of this year's conference is Together, and we will consider Singapore's demographic challenges and opportunities as a global city-state without natural resources. And now, please welcome Mr. Janadas Devan, the director of IPS, to kick off today's program. Director. Professor Wang Gangwu, immediate past chairman of Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, acting dean of the school, Mr. Professor Danny Kua, chairman of PSC, Mr. Eddie Teo, the first director of IPS, Professor Chan Heng Chi, um, ladies and gentlemen, friends. Let me begin by thanking our sponsors, all those listed on the backdrop behind me, for their generosity. Thank you also to DPM Theo Chi Hien, who will be joining us at lunch, and Minister of Finance, Mr. Heng Sui Kiet. Our speakers, and we have a very distinguished list today, and the moderators. And finally, all of you, thank you for turning up on a very early morning for this conference. We return this year to a one-word theme for Singapore Perspectives, together. Last year was two words, what if, unlike the previous five, inequality in 2012, governance in 2013, differences, choices, and we in the following years. Looking back on this series over seven years, it occurs to me they disclose a certain obsession. Again and again, we have returned to the potential fault lines in our society. IPS was among the first institutions here to look at the question of income inequality. That was in 2012. We have returned repeatedly to questions of racial and religious diversities, of gender and sexuality too, and of class and social mobility. In other words, how our diversities can be a bane, how they might be a strength, what might divide us, and how we might be kept together. These obsessions are in keeping with IPS's research agenda, which consists of, one, managing diversities of all kinds, both what we are familiar with, like race, religion, and language, as well as newly emergent ones, like sexuality. Two, managing the challenges of an aging society, not forgetting how we might exploit and accentuate the benefits of an aging society. Three, inequality and social mobility, and for governance of a global city-state, the problems peculiar to a city-state of which Singapore is the preeminent and almost sole example in the world today. What I'd like to do in this opening is frame the demographic issues we will discuss today in the context of Singapore being a city-state. For it is crucial that we recognize the centrality of this island nation being a city when we consider questions pertaining to our population. We are not an aging society in a large country. We are not a society trying to accommodate a large immigrant population in a country with lots of space. We are not an advanced global city with a large hinterland. We are but a city-state. We are only a city-state. I touched on this subject in last year's Singapore Perspectives, and we will repeat some of the points I made then. Singapore, as I said, is a country as well as a city. We don't always keep this obvious fact in mind. We forget. But Singapore is a city that happens also to be a country, a country that is only a city, a country that has no country, as in countryside, outside the city. Or to put it differently, there is no country beyond the city. This city is all the country that we have. 
This fact informs consciously and unconsciously, perceptibly and imperceptibly, every facet of our existence. And this is how I illustrated this point last year. One, Singapore is the only city in the world that has a military. London doesn't have a navy, we do. Tokyo doesn't have an air force, we do. Shanghai doesn't have its own army or terexes for that matter, we do. Two, all of Singapore's gateways, its port, its airport, have to be located within the city. You can't put Changi Airport, for instance, somewhere out in the boondocks, a couple or so hours outside the city, like Narita or Heathrow or KLIA, for that matter, for the simple reason Singapore doesn't have a boondock. You disembark at our gateways and you're already within the city, not so much as a drawbridge or a moat separates the city walls from the outside. Three, unusual among global cities, Singapore has a sizable manufacturing base, 20% of our GDP. There are a number of reasons why this should be so, but one is because we are a city as well as a country. If we were to have a purely social service economy like London or New York or other global cities, with high-paying jobs in finance and banking at one end, and low-paying jobs flipping hamburgers and providing in-situ services at the other, our income inequalities would be far worse. Indeed, our Gini coefficient is already high, but compared to other countries. When compared to other global cities, we are considerably better off, in large part because we have a substantial manufacturing base providing a range of jobs in the middle. Now guess how much land, physical space, do these three activities which this city has to undertake because it is also a country occupy? Military for training, air bases, naval bases, etc. Gateways, airport, port, manufacturing. Whenever I ask this question of students or civil servants, the guesses vary from 15 to 25%. The correct answer is 42 to 43%. Just a little less than half of this not considerable little red dot, and I've not included the land that we have to devote to water reservoirs, 5%, housing, 17%, roads and rail, 13%, parks and nature reserves, 9%, and all the other accoutrements of civilized existence. Almost half of the city's land area has to be devoted to functions that we have to perform because the city is also a country. You see, Singapore is a most unlikely country. There is no other country, no other city of this size in the world that is also a country. That is why our founding fathers, every one of them, began their political lives believing Singapore, a city, couldn't survive on its own, that it had to be joined to a hinterland, Malaya. And believing that, they fought for a merger only to be ejected from Malaysia after less than two years. To become a country with no countryside, a city-state with no hinterland. That Singapore, that Singapore should exist as a city and a country is a miracle. But it is a miracle that contains a contradiction inherent in it being both a city and a country. And sustaining this miracle means somehow straddling this contradiction, riding it, managing it, not overcoming it as such, for it cannot be overcome so long as we remain a sovereign city-state. Let me illustrate this contradiction. Japan, as we know, is, an eight, is a rapidly aging society. Indeed, its population shrank by 400,000 just last year. If current trends continue, its population will shrink further from 126.5 million now to 88 million by 2065 and only 50 million 100 years from now. Note I said Japan, not Tokyo, which isn't shrinking yet. Japan is facing an existential crisis, but I dare say there will still be a Japan if there were only 50 million Japanese, as indeed was the case at the beginning of the last century. But there can be no city, a global city, Tokyo, that shrinks at this rate. 
ditto Singapore. Another illustration, take the question of talent, which has become something of a dirty word in Singapore by dint of it having been associated with foreign for some time. Why should cities exist? Why did they come into existence in the course of human history over the last 5,000 years or so, and continue to thrive despite the countless calamities that have visited them, from volcanic eruptions and great fires, to epidemics from aerial bombings, to tsunamis and earthquakes? What is their evolutionary advantage? Cities exist primarily because they are a social formation that brings together large numbers of people. That collection of large numbers in close proximity enables the efficient mobilization and organization of resources, including of capital and above all of talent. That was as true of Mahenjo-daro in 2500 BC and the Rome of Augustus Caesar around the time of Christ as it is today of London and New York. The most thriving global cities tend also to be the most diverse, the most open and dynamic, the most cosmopolitan. Cities often consist, consist of large numbers of rootless people, as they say, or at the very least, large segments of their population are mobile or itinerant. This is, of course, more true of modern cities and among contemporary cities, more true of larger metropolitan centers than of smaller cities. But it was true in some respects of even cities in the past. For example, William Shakespeare was born in Stratford-upon-Avon, moved to London to earn a living as an actor and playwright, only to move back to the relatively bucolic setting of Stratford, Stratford in his retirement. I dare say if Singapore had remained a part of Malaysia, many of us here may well have retired to Kuantan or Mersing or Langkawi but we are now only a city and we can't locate so much as a nursing home for old folks outside this country. Now the words I have used to describe the city and city life, rootless, mobile, itinerant people, diverse, cosmopolitan, dynamic, open to the world and welcoming of all talent. All these terms do not necessarily describe a country. Indeed, countries tend to be altogether more stable entities. They change, certainly, but not as rapidly as cities. They can be diverse, but not as vibrantly and confusingly so as cities. They can have multiple identities, but they are not as bewilderingly diffuse as cities. Think the United States and think New York City, which only legally and politically belongs to the US. Culturally and spiritually, it lives on another plane. Ditto United Kingdom and London, China and Shanghai, Japan and Tokyo. Countries tend to be oriented inwards towards themselves. Cities tend to be oriented outwards towards others. What happens in the case of city-states, in the case of Singapore? Our identity is forever bifurcated between the global and the local. There is a part of Singapore that is outward-looking, cosmopolitan, open. And there is another that is more oriented towards itself, if not insular, more inward-focused, if not closed. We have geographic shorthands for these two Singapores, the Singapore of Shenton Way in the financial district and the Singapore of the Heartlands. The Singapore of Clark Quay, where I work, feels very different from the Singapore of Topayo, where I live. I rub shoulders with New York, London, Shanghai, and Tokyo at Clark Key. I feel at home in Topayo. I can describe the political, economic, and social contradiction between these two Singaporeans briefly thus. If this island nation does not remain one of the world's leading global cities, it cannot survive as an economy. We might as well have not left, left Malaysia. To sustain itself as a leading global city, Singapore must remain open to the world, welcome all varieties of talents, become and remain a cosmopolitan society and culture. To remain a nation, however, Singapore cannot be forever turned determinately outwards. It cannot be so porous 
to the outside as to allow itself to be overwhelmed by the foreign. And it cannot resign itself to a diffuse and rootless cosmopolitanism. Life exists here and now in a particular time and place, or it cannot exist at all. The global economy doubtless exists, but there is no socius, no society, no community that answers to it. Singapore, this island nation, is here, now, and forever. The question is, how do you reconcile this Singapore of home and nation with that other equally real, equally crucial, equally urgent and insistent global and cosmopolitan Singapore? You earn a living, survive in the latter, the global Singapore. You have your home, your being in the former, the nation that is Singapore. What happened with Brexit in the United Kingdom can happen here. What happened with the election of Donald Trump as US president can also happen here. In Brexit, the city, London, voted overwhelmingly for Europe and globalization, while the rest of the country thought Britain could go it alone. In the tragic US 2016 presidential elections, while both the East and West Coast, as well as almost all major urban centers voted overwhelmingly for the Democratic Hillary Clinton, the rest of the country, flyover country, the coastal elites used to sniff, voted for the Republican Donald Trump. On one side, the parts of America that benefited from globalization and trade, the high-tech, connected, cosmopolitan America, and the other, the parts of America that didn't benefit from globalization and trade, the people who had lost their jobs to foreign competition, or so they claim, the people whom Hillary Clinton had referred to as the basket of deplorables. Good, ordinary, decent people who happened to feel, with good reason, that they were being looked down upon, ignored by the globalized coastal elites. They voted for the boorish Donald Trump. The same divisions can happen here within the same city between the two Singapores. And the divisions between the two Singapores can be accentuated by differences of class and of race too, if the class divisions coincide with racial ones. It can also be accentuated by differences of age, with the young seeing their future in an open and globalized Singapore and the elders seeing theirs in a more stable in Singapore that is relatively more stable and closed. With the young choosing, as in Brexit, a future-oriented, forward-thrusting, productive economy, and the elders preferring instead consumption. This is why this conference on our demographic challenges is entitled Together. For it seems to me self-evident that unless we take great pains to remain together, our society too can fracture. That is why I believe government should be the place where people are brought together. Why I believe our politics and policy must always keep their eyes trained on keeping us together. For the alternative is unthinkable. The city Singapore cannot separate from the country Singapore. Thank you.